worship of the Lord. Take a 
Let praise be the weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be the weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. this mic okay okay well good morning and welcome to worship here at first united methodist church my name is katie and i'm one of the pastors here on staff and we are so excited that you have joined us for worship this morning a couple of announcements as we continue on in worship uh, you have a bulletin either in your seat or near your seat we invite you to grab that and read through the back of our bulletin. It has a ton of announcements, but I will draw your attention to just a couple. Next Sunday, a week from today, our United Methodist men are having a barbecue lunch. I think it's pulled pork. We established that in the first service, that it's pulled pork. Uh, and we are excited to support our United Methodist men. Any tickets? Anyone have any tickets? No. Okay, that's okay because you can come get them from the church office or I think they will have some walk-up tickets. So make sure to get a ticket, support the United Methodist Men's Scholarship, and you don't have to go home and cook. Can I get an amen? <laughs> I've been at an annual conference with the bishop, so I'm going to do this because he does this. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. 
Uh, that's right. We did uh, just get back from annual conference. We had Bob Gorman and Sarah Shaw uh, come with us. They were our lay delegates in addition to Ricky and I, and we are super excited that we're back. They are going to give a full report in The Voice as well as in person in the coming weeks, but just know that they represented you guys well. So if you see them, give them a high five. Thank them for being your delegates. We are so grateful for their service to the conference and to our church. Last but not least, I will point out, you know, we, do, we have a ton of volunteers that make our ministries in this church run like a smooth, well-oiled machine. One of the many ministries that we have volunteers is youth ministry. And, you know, a personal privilege that I get to work with our youth. But I will say that we are looking for two specific volunteer needs as we enter into the fall. That's right. You know, you have a couple weeks left of break. We are already prepping for the fall. Uh, we are looking for some men who want to pour into the lives of our guys, especially in our youth ministry. So if you are feeling called to that, please feel free to come talk to me. Or you can talk to Ricky. He did it. So he can uh, give us two cents. But we would love, if you feel called to youth ministry, we would love to talk with you more about that. You can see more details in the bulletin. As we enter, or as we continue in ministry, or in worship today, I want to invite all of our kids, maybe kids in age, but also kids at heart to come up. They're going to go uh, have kids moments with what might be my favorite kids moments ever, to the point where I'm definitely going to be down here for it. So kids, come on up. You're going to hang out with Miss Patty, and she's going to teach us about going to the grocery, I think. Can I have the mic? I, I, I like the mic a lot, but I like talking. I'm glad to see you. I, Henry's not here, and I, he was so important this morning. Um, I'm really glad to see you all. You look wonderful. I've got something to show you, and you have to, you have to help me, you guys, okay? See those cards? Pull these cards out for me, just the cards. All right, I'll tell you what to do with them in a minute. All right. All right, if Ricky, this morning I told him to give me four-minute mark, and he bounced it like I told him to. Uh, Y'all aren't going to believe this, but I didn't hear it. So he had to throw it to Tommy, and I still didn't stop, so... It's your job. Oh, yay! Now, look. Bounce it so I can see it. I can do that. Okay. All right. I'm going to do my best to be brief. Okay. What's in this basket? Muffins. Guess who made these muffins? Yes, I did. I made these muffins. I'm going to tell you how I made them. I've got a grandson that loves muffins. When he was little, I made them for him. And then he got older, and I made them with him. And now he makes them all by himself. It's so cool. And I sit back there and I go, that's really good. You know what this is? Okay, talk loud because they want to hear. What is it? I'm a muffin bag. A muffin bag. What was in the muffin bag? Blueberries. There's blueberries. What else? Muffins? Not yet. Muffins weren't in here. What's in here was before I started, you know? You know? Oh, look, at we got some smart children. Ingredients. It takes for the muffin mix, and it takes milk. That's it. And But you've got to have the right amounts. You've got to follow these. What are these on the back of the package? Well, ingredients, but what else? Do y'all know what? Um, what? Say that louder. That's exactly. Instructions. And if I don't follow these instructions, my muffins are not going to turn out good. So I did. I followed these instructions very closely. Now, you know what this is? And it's, it is so important to me because it has instructions. And this is what I, the one thing, I'm, I'm 71 years old. And the one thing I truly know is that God really loves me. And he really loves you too. And he wants us to be happy. Now, some days, some things don't go the way I want them. And I don't always feel real happy. But if I follow the directions and the rules, 
it ends up working out every time. He loves us. I'm, and there's rules in here, just like the directions. I have to follow them in order for my muffins to turn out correctly. And for me to be a good person, I need to follow these directions. Now, you're going to help me. Hand me the card that has the words on it. Not just one word, a bunch of words. Thank you. Now, while I'm reading this, I want you to give three of those people those cards. I don't care. And you can keep one if you'd like. Just hold the card. Okay, you ready? All right, this is, what, this is the message. This is the rule I want you to hear today. And it's the rule I like to follow every day. Um, I have the right to do anything I want to. Anything I want to, which is really kind of cool. But there's a lot of things that I want to do that I really shouldn't do. But that's beside the point. But this one, this is the rule. It says, I can do anything I want to, but not everything I do, I could do is good. So no one should seek their own good, but only for the good of others. So am I supposed to do what I like? Well, you know, he, but he loves me and he wants me to be happy. So that's not just the whole thing. But the most important thing is we should take care of, okay, yeah, say it again. People. That's right. We've got cards in front of them. If you have the cross, hold it up. Hold it up high. All right, that stands for God. Got it? What's that stand for? God. Okay, hold up the one that has all the people on it. That stands for people. Say it. People. All right, and the other one stands for... <laughs> the other one stands for me. Hold it up. All right, which one of those do you think is the most important? Come on. Yes, God's the most important. Stand up. God's the most important. Okay, here comes the hard one. What comes next? What's supposed to come next? People, stand up. And what's the last thing we should consider? Stand up, me. All right, that's the whole point. We should be taking care of others. You did fantastic. Y'all can sit down. Okay, what I want you to remember, now listen to these things. Sometimes we don't want to do what's right, but never be afraid to do what's right. And you know what right is most of the time, don't you? And we also should be taking care of other people. So if you see somebody that needs something, you should take care of them. And, you know, if you ever think something nice about somebody, like, ooh, she's got pretty fingernails, or ooh, I like her hairdo, or ooh, that sure was a nice thing she just said to me. You know what you should do when you think something nice about somebody else? Tell me. I'll thank them. Well, if you're thinking it, they don't know what you're thinking, so what should you do if you think something nice? Tell them. Okay, good girl, say it loud. Tell, tell them. Don't be afraid to tell people good stuff because we all need to hear it. And don't be afraid to do what's right. And remember that we're supposed to take do what God wants us to first. And what's second? Other people. And what, what's the last thing we should consider? Yes, you're right, me. Okay, let's say, let's say a prayer. You ready? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for these beautiful children, this wonderful church. Thank you for all, all of us have, getting to hear these messages. Help us not to be afraid to do what's right, Lord, and to put other, others before ourselves and to notice when people need help or people need to be lifted up. And thank you all for all those people that are sitting behind me that have done just that for me over and over. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You guys were awesome. Well, thank you. You guys can go back to your seats. Uh, I guess you probably will want this back. Probably. You know, Ricky said in the first service, I couldn't throw it. I think I just proved him wrong. Well, now we come time where we get to give back to God, where we get to respond to his goodness, to his kindness, to his faithfulness in our lives. And so we're going to come, the ushers are going to come forward and they're going to accept our offerings that we get to give back to the Lord. And we give in response, not out of obligation, but because we serve a really good God who loves us and has given us so very much already. So I'm going to invite our ushers forward and our band's going to lead us in worship.
I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now He won't fail me now And in the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out You're working all things out Yes, I will sing for joy in the lowest valley and yes I will bless your name yes I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy in all my days yes I will same God who never fails, will not fail me now. You won't fail me now, and in the waiting. The same God who's never late, is working all things out. You're working all things out. Stand with us. Yes, I will. The door in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy in all my days. Yes, I will in all my days. Yes, I will not choose to fail. I just thank you for this place where we can come together just to worship you, God, and just lift your name up and say, yes, I will, to anything you call us to do, God, because we want to be faithful to you, God. We want to put you above everything else, God. We want to serve people. We want to serve you and just always be doing what you have us here for, Lord. And I just pray for this word that comes to us today. Uh, God, just make it a special word specifically to our hearts, God, and whatever you'd have to say to us, Lord. We want to just be open ears and open-hearted about it and just making sure that we can hear whatever you have for us, Lord. Thank you. Uh, grateful for uh, for Micah being with us this morning and uh, for leading us in worship so well. Thanks for being with us and uh, for leading us. Uh, just want to let you know, Tom is is okay. Uh, he had been sick. He's fully recovered. He's just out doing his his music gig this morning. So we're he's blessing someone else this this morning, and so Mike is here to bless us. Uh, so I want to let you know that. Um, so this morning we're continuing in our sermon series on. Um, uh, what we call uh, Check Yourself, Life Lessons from the Grocery Store. I can't remember last week, uh, initially I was, wanted to name the sermon series Ricky's Pet Peeves, um, and, uh, but cooler heads prevailed. And uh, so we began last week 
uh, challenging ourselves to stop yelling at the cashier. Uh, I challenge you to spend a whole week not yelling at the cashier. How did you do? All right, good, good. Well, I didn't get any bad reports on any of you. So, But learning about how um, anger in our life is often misplaced, and we often take out our anger on people that don't deserve it, don't have anything to do with it. And so um, that's one of our first lessons we've learned from the grocery store, that uh, we can uh, find healthy ways to deal with our emotions and uh, give, uh, give that anger uh, not to the person at the cashier stand, uh, but to, to give that to God. Uh, so this week, we're going to go on another one of Ricky's pet peeves at the grocery store. But before I let you know that, we have to have a little bit of definition time. I need you, there's a little audience participation to help me on what we're going to call this thing. It's a very important thing at the grocery store, and I need the collective wisdom to see what you call it, okay? So, um, earlier today, I secured for us a miniature version of this thing, okay? Uh, I, I, I borrowed it for Jesus. Um, uh, now, I'm just curious, what do you call this? Just shout it out. Okay, all right. I heard some shopping cart, very, mini- very, very few of you. I heard a grocery cart, but the majority of you got it correct. This is a buggy, right? Exactly, right. So uh, growing, growing up, that's what my family called it as well. This was the buggy. And my pet peeve, if you can't guess it already or if you haven't looked in the bulletin, is the fact I can't stand it when people don't put up the buggy and leave these things all over the, the parking lot like it's some sort of, you know, um, obstacle course, right? So... If you don't hear anything else from the sermon, and I hope you do, but in case you don't, I want you to put up the buggy, all right? And we're going to talk about why that's important as Christians to put up the buggy. Now, before we do that, though, I I kid you not, you know, uh, sometimes your phone listens to you. Do you know that? Right? And so as I was talking to some people about this uh, uh, sermon, uh, lo and behold, on social media, so you know it's got to be true was a link someone posted to an article from Scientific American magazine where they did a scientific behavioral study on, of all things, why people don't put up the buggy. And in this article that I read this week, they talked about the several reasons people give or tell themselves about why they don't do the simple act of returning the shopping cart. Uh, A lot of people say, and these are in no particular order, they're just the top responses, Um, It's too far from where I parked to bring it back. Okay? All right. I understand. Too far. That's right. Uh, Some people say uh, they have a child, and once they've got the child in the car, they don't want to leave the child unattended to return the cart. Okay, that's, we're getting toward a legitimate reason, but you might not do that. Uh, The weather's bad. It's raining, and I don't want to run all the way back and forth, right? Okay. Um, uh, They're physically unable to do it. Again, legitimate reason. Now, here's, here's where we start getting a little bit squirrely here. Uh, the perception that it's someone else's job to collect the carts. It's not my job to do it. Somebody else should be doing it. Or an excuse you tell yourself, I'm going to leave it for someone else to use it. Right? Right? So those are some top reasons why people say they don't return the buggy. And now, here's the thing, and we're not going to judge each other. This This is church. This is just confession time. I imagine all of us from time to time have maybe found ourselves in a situation where we did not put the buggy up, okay? Now, that's okay to admit that sometimes you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, this article went on to explain the categories. This is a really nerdy article. I loved it. It went on to explain the categories of people who do return. And I'm curious where you might put yourself in this category. Of course, you have the never returners. doesn't matter what the situation is. That cart is never going back to where it came from. It's always going to be left out in the parking lot, right? So none of you probably are never returners. No. Okay, good. The other category is always returners. 
right? No matter how far the distance is, how bad the weather is, how busy you are, how in a hurry you are, you are an always returner. You always put the, the cart up. Great, I love that. Then there are some other groups. A convenience returner. That if you're close enough to the receptacle, if you're close enough to where it goes, if you don't have anything else to do, if your hands aren't too full, or you're not in too much of a hurry, if it's not an inconvenience, then from time to time, more often than not, you put it back up. And then this group, the pressure returners. This group will return the cart if there are other people around. But if the coast is clear, well, we just leave it where it be, right? So I'm curious, kind of, you don't have to answer out, but just kind of think about where you might find yourself in that group. Now, here's the thing, and, and I'm going to get to the Bible here, I promise. I, I have come to find out, and I've even looked in the Mississippi Code. Did you know there is no law that requires you to return the cart to the store? There's no law. There's no law. You don't have to return the cart. You don't have to put the buggy up. You should, personal opinion, but you don't have to. In fact, there are lots of things in this world that you don't have to do, even though you should. And of course, there are lots of things in this world that you shouldn't do, but you are free to. And that is one of the, the real positive aspects of our life in Christ and the challenging aspects. We're free to do really anything that we want to do. But with freedom comes responsibility. And then a step further as a Christian we are challenged to realize that there are lots of things that are lawful for us to do. But as followers in Christ, we, we don't use that freedom for our own advantage. And just in case you think I'm making that up, let's look together at a passage of Scripture. From 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth to Christians who believe in Jesus in the city of Corinth. And in this passage in which he's describing lots of things, lots of ways of being, lots of, lots of uh, uh, choices that the church is going to make about how they worship and how they practice communion and, and how they treat one another, he comes to a particular passage that I'm going to read and then try to unpack what he what he's trying to say here. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and uh, I'm going to start with just reading a couple of verses, verses 23 and 24. And Paul writes this, All things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Do not seek your own advantage, but seek that of the other. So, uh, Paul is beginning this passage by talking about, hey, you know, all things are lawful, all things are legal for you to do, but not everything's good for you to do. Not everything's beneficial. You have a freedom to do lots of things, but not all the things that you could do build up or encourage people. In fact, Paul says, you shouldn't seek your own advantage, but to think of others. Now, you might wonder, okay, I really don't know, Ricky, what that has to do with the shopping cart. Except the fact that the context of this whole section of Paul's letter is a question that the Corinthians have asked Paul about buying meat in the marketplace. So here's what's going on in the church at Corinth. The city of Corinth is a Greek city, um, and as a Greek city, it practices most of the, the typical pagan uh, religious practices. There are temples to various gods and goddesses of the Greek and, and uh, um, uh, pagan pantheon. And there are Christians living in the city of Corinth who have converted to Christ out of their Gentile uh, past. So they believe in Jesus as 
uh, their Savior, their Lord. There are also members of the church of Corinth who grew up Jewish and practicing all of the Jewish dietary laws, the kosher laws, the worship laws. They believe in Jesus as the Messiah, but they still um, have a lot of the uh, religious and cultural understanding of keeping kosher. And there's a, a growing question in the early church about what practices you have to follow in order to be a Christian. Is it just believing in Jesus and, and seeing Him as Savior? Or do you have to do all the other Jewish laws and practices? Furthermore, the, the uh, former uh, 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 pagan people who have converted to Jesus, um, they're a little concerned about this practice of eating meat that they've bought in the marketplace and its connection to idol worship. All right, so stay with me here. In the church uh, in Corinth, they're just wondering, when we go to the grocery store and we buy the food there at the marketplace, should we be worried if it has any connection to idol worship? Because here's the thing. Remember when I said there are these temples to all these different gods and goddesses in the city of Corinth? Uh, one of the ways that those temples funded themselves is when people brought offerings to the temple, the priest would take some of the offerings, some of the meat, some of the foods, uh, sacrificed to the gods or goddesses. They'd keep some for themselves to feed themselves. And then they would sell the rest of it in the marketplace as a way of raising money for their temples. Now, for most people in Corinth, not a big deal, right? It's part of the economic structure. We offer food to the God at the temple. The priests then sell it in the market. They make money. We get meat. Everybody's happy. But if you're a Christian, if you've been told that the God of the universe came to us in Jesus and He is the only God, the only one worthy of our worship, then should we not abstain from this meat? Or, the question came, we're, we're Jewish Christians, right? We grew up keeping kosher. We would never eat this kind of meat. We would never eat this. Should, should we do that? And then furthermore, to complicate it all, there are some Christians who are just wondering, you know, it's kind of awkward because this is the meat that we have to buy. And if I go over to a friend's house and they've cooked me dinner, do I make a big scene to ask them, like, where do they get it? Where is it from? There's a, all this kind of just stuff around food and, and where we buy it and how it's prepared and what does that do for us. All these things which for you and me seem kind of just weird and foreign to us. And like it's not a big deal. Like it's really not a big deal whether or not you put the card up, right? It's just kind of what you do at the grocery store. You either, good or not, you're, you either do it or you don't. And so what's this big deal? Now here's the thing. You might think Paul would say something like, well, you want to abstain from idol worship altogether, so don't eat the meat. Or he might you think, well, Paul grew up Jewish. You might think, well, keep kosher. It's a good idea just in case. But instead, Paul says, you know what? It's all lawful for you. There's no law against eating the meat. In fact, this is what he says, continuing on in verse 25. You can eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth and its fullness belong to the Lord. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. Paul seems to suggest that for the Christian, you have a choice. And if it doesn't bother you, go ahead and eat. If you go to a neighbor's house and they've invited you, they're not a believer, they don't have any kind of worry about this food, then go ahead and eat. It's not a big deal. It's your personal choice. But then he goes on to say, if it does bother someone, it, if it's a, a stumbling block for someone, he says this, if it's a matter of conscience, then don't eat out of consideration for the other. What's Paul saying there? You have the choice. It's lawful for you to eat. But you also have a responsibility to respect 
the others. You have a responsibility in what you do to use your freedom, not for your own preference, but for the benefit of the others. And I find this fascinating. Sometimes Paul has this reputation of being kind of real strident and and real kind of, you know, my way or the highway. But so often we find in Paul a generous spirit that is seeking out for the welfare of the community. Even if it means sacrificing your own personal preference. Because I love to eat. And I love to eat, and, and particularly if you're paying for it and you're inviting me to eat you're at your house, I'm going to eat that food. It's going to be great. Even though sometimes it may be not my preference. There are some times in our life where we choose to make the, the choice to limit our own preference for the sake of others. You know, Paul says there's no law compelling you to do this, no law compelling you to act, no, com- no law compelling you to eat or to not eat. It's all going to be a personal choice, but be mindful that your choices, your preferences, your decisions don't impact others in negative ways or make it harder for them or put a burden on them that you wouldn't put on yourself. Now, that may sound a little bit kind of wishy-washy, like you're going to change your behavior depending on who you're around. And if it does, I've got bad news for you. It's exactly what Paul is about to say. In fact, listen to this. He goes on, he finishes this whole section uh, in verse 31. Uh, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but seeking that of many, so that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. I want to read that again because, again, some people think this doesn't sound like Paul, but I think this is the heart of Paul, right? He says this, I try to please everyone in everything I do. Not seek my own advantage, but the advantage of others, so that they may be saved. Paul really believes that what you eat doesn't save you. What you wear doesn't save you. What you abstain from doesn't save you. Jesus is the one who saves you. And he's willing He's willing to limit his own preferences. He's willing to to not eat meat with this group and to eat pulled pork with this group. He's willing to learn this language and that language. He's willing to treat others as they desire to be treated. He's willing to put himself second. He's willing to limit his own preferences. And, And I would imagine this. Paul will go the extra mile and put the cart up and take the simple, small sacrifice so that someone else might have it just a bit easier. Not because he wants to be liked by everybody, but because he wants everyone to come to know Jesus. And whatever he can do, whatever small thing, whatever small step, Whatever sacrifice, he's willing so that he might be in a position that someone else's life is made a bit easier, a bit simpler, a bit more generous and kind so that he can share Jesus with them. I love that about Paul. And I confess that there are times when I make my own personal preference an idol. Because there are things in my life that I prefer and things that I would prefer not to do. People that I like to hang out with and people that I'd rather not. And there's a way of living in which we might just look out for our own self. And at the end of the day, there's no law that's going to make you be nice to people. Or to be kind to people. Or to take those small, simple steps to help other people. There's no law. But it is up to you. 
how you choose to live. You see, last week we, we promised that we were going to spend a whole week not yelling at people that don't deserve it. And sometimes just abstaining from that is a really good step. But beyond just not doing something, this week I want you to think about taking on a forward and meaningful action. So if you've gotten a whole week behind you of not yelling at anybody this week, I want you to think about some small and simple things you can do to make someone's life a little bit easier. It might mean limiting your own preference. It might mean saying, you know what, I'm not going to have it my way in this situation or in this conversation. I'm going to seek the advantage, not of myself, as Paul says. I'm going to seek the advantage of others. And that's why I say, let's put up the shopping cart. Now, I know that putting up this cart is not necessarily going to bring the kingdom of God on earth. But it's not going to hurt. And it's going to be good practice for you. Because every time you do the simple act of putting the cart up, you're making it a little bit easier on that person who's responsible for doing that. You're going to make it a little bit easier on that person who's struggling to find a parking space and your cart's not going to be in the way. You're going to, find, you're going to help it just be a little bit cleaner and nicer over at the Kroger this week. And it's going to be good practice for you. Because what you're really practicing is looking for those simple, small acts in which you sacrifice a little bit of your time, a little bit of your energy, a little bit of your personal convenience, and thinking of others. Because when we practice it in the small ways, when it finally comes to a big moment of sacrifice, you've already built up those muscles to put yourself second to think of the others in your midst, to think of the small, simple acts of generosity and kindness. Because all those big, wonderful acts of, of amazing generosity, amazing sacrifice, those are rare. And I know every single time that big sacrifice, that big step has been made, it was a result of many intentional small acts of putting others before you, of thinking of others before you think of yourself, of saying, yeah, I have the ability to do anything and everything in this world, but I choose to serve others rather than my own self. Not so that other people will love me and like me and think really good things of me, But because like Paul, I want to be the type of person that is so generous and so loving and so sacrificial to other people that in moments that I can't yet anticipate, they will see Jesus in me. So this week, that's all I want you to do. Let's put up the buggies. Practice acts of sacrifice, of serving others, of putting others first. Because I've become convinced, as Paul says, anything that I can do that someone might come to know Jesus, any sacrifice I can make, big or small, is worth it if someone else might see me and want to know why. And then like Paul, each of us can point to Christ and say, because he did it for me. So let's put up the buggies, friends. And, and let's change the world. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful that uh, you've given so much to us and that you love us so much. You've given us freedom and salvation. And you haven't really asked anything in return except to love you. 
and so we're grateful for that. We love that you take us how we are and you don't expect us to clean ourselves up, that you just take us all and love us and forgive us. But we're also grateful, Lord, that not only do you desire that for us, you desire it for everyone in this world. And you promise that you won't leave us like you find us. And so you challenge us to, to give up some of the freedom that we have, the, the preferences that we have, the desires that we have, that we might make small acts of sacrifice so that others' lives may just be a bit easier, that this world might be a bit kinder, that we might be more loving toward one another and open up space that others might be drawn to you. Lord, sometimes we know it's kind of, kind of silly to think that something as, as simple as that can make a difference in the world. So Lord, show us this week just some small way in which our sacrifice might open up the door for someone to begin a relationship with you. Thank you, Lord. And we can't wait to see what you will do in and through us this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the darkness you were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle Stand and worship with us. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise for.
Um, so before we go and uh, do our benediction, uh, we do want to recognize and pray for some really special people. And so we're going to embarrass them. Uh, so the Hilliards, come on up, come on up. Um, so uh, I know, um, there we go. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't rehearse this. So, uh, so uh, many of you probably already know uh, that the Hilliards will uh, be leaving. And um, uh, Rob, who served uh, faithfully and well as the uh, commander of the Corps of Engineers here, has, uh, is going to his next duty station in Italy. So I'm looking forward to, to visiting you. And, uh, and so we're grateful for that, and uh, we want to pray for you, um, because we're going to miss you, but we know that uh, this is a life of, of service and sacrifice that you all have committed to, and, and that's inspiring uh, for us, because not only are you doing that, you're also, uh, you live and uh, share your faith in so many ways. Uh, I'm going to remember so many things. Sam, I'm going to remember how you have kept me honest on, on, my, on my analogies and, and use. So, <laughs> so he's kept me honest on my Roman illustrations, so I appreciate that. Uh, Gabby, you have inspired us uh, through your gift of dance and have, have shown us that in addition to serving in our, in our youth as a small group leader. Um, and so just so grateful for that. Uh, Donna, I feel like every time we needed something, whether it's uh, VBS or uh, uh, being present, you were there and you were so happy and so excited to be that. Rob, you've kept us safe on the security team, uh, and uh, uh, very, very grateful for that. And, of course, I'm going to be personally, personally grateful forever for you uh, swearing me into the Navy and uh, rendering the oath. And um, uh, so uh, this isn't goodbye as Christians together. Uh, it's just until we see each other again. Uh, and, again, if that's in Italy, I'm fine. I, I, can, I can go. I can fly. So anytime you need me there, I'm there. Uh, but we want to pray for you all and to bless you on this next step of, of uh, your journey. And so uh, if you would, if you feel comfortable, uh, extend a hand uh, toward, uh, toward the Hilliards and let's pray together. Uh, Father, we are grateful for the gift of, of family. Uh, and not just those who are our blood relatives, but how in this Christian faith, you call us to be your brothers and sisters. And so you have called the Hilliards to, to be with us for a time, to be our family, to serve you in this place. They have brought their unique gifts, their talents, their time, but most importantly, their love. And they've shared it here. And now you've called them to another step in their journey. So we pray for them, for safe travels, for blessings, for mercies, that they would have fun and grow as a family together as they serve in this new place. Lord, we will miss them, but we know that in you, we are still together. And we can't wait to hear what they will do in your name. So all this we ask in the name of the one who gave his life that we might, in him, be the children of the Father, brothers and sisters, now and forever. Amen. All right. There we go. Well, since you're already standing, let me just say this. May God, grace and mercy, abide with each of you this day. And go forth to share his love in small and simple ways. That others might see in you a glimpse of Jesus. And desire to know him more. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Sure thing. Sure thing. Yeah. Yeah. And let us, you know, let us know your address so we can write y'all and send y'all stuff. And...